This show is brought to you in part with a grant from Hokuma's Sewing Center in Redding, California, and viewers like you. Welcome to the unique and beautiful world of Celtic quilting. My name is Anne Gibbons, and with me is Patrick Moriarty. Together we're going to take you on an unforgettable journey from the very traditional Celtic style of quilting to the abstract, with a few pleasant surprises thrown in along the way. First, let's take a look at Philomena Durkin's work. Philomena is known in the US as the Grand Dame of Celtic quilting. She still carries the Irish lilt in her voice from her homeland. Philomena has been quilting for over 25 years. Philomena introduced Celtic design to the quilting world in 1980 with the publication of her first book. Her style of quilting is traditional. Let's take a look through the garden gate. The floral carpets of the Celtic countryside are the inspiration for this quilt. Philomena's love affair with flowers allowed her to paint with fabric and combine the floral motif with interlaced design. The bias allows the flower to come alive in three dimensions. Through the garden gate follows a tradition of floral motifs in first century Celtic art, expressed on this magnificent gold torque, the broiter collar. This collar embodies carved form, trumpet spirals, and floral motifs. The Celts were known in the classical world by the elegantly elaborate torques they wore. From the 6th to the 12th century AD, Celtic art flourished in gospel books, stone carvings, metal carvings, and tombstones, most notable being the Tara brooch and the Arda chalice. It was mainly in gospel books that the amazingly beautiful art grew and left its heritage for us all. In this next quilt by Philomena, Celtic Sampler 2, Philomena chose the interlace motif and adapted new designs. Celtic interlace is noted for its under and over feature, which once started should be consistent throughout the whole design. One hard and fast rule for making Celtic interlace is that at any one point in the design, no more than two lines may cross. The Book of Kells was Philomena's inspiration for her quilt designs. The Book of Kells is the best known source of Celtic knots and other types of Celtic ornamentation. The Book of Kells is one of the most beautifully illuminated manuscripts ever created. It is a lavishly ornamented transcription of the four gospels in Latin. Penned around 800 AD, the incredible degree of ornament and detail caused Geraldus Cambrensis in the 12th century to call it the work not of men, but of angels. Another of Philomena's quilts is Roisin. Celtic knots or Celtic interlace are ornamental patterns which were used to decorate Bible manuscripts such as the Book of Kells. Monuments. Celtic crosses, cross slabs, and jewelry.
Celtic interlace was probably used in other media, such as wood carving. and textiles, but these have not survived. In recent years, Celtic knots have enjoyed a revival. Much of this has amounted to copies of historical knots used in tourist-type craft goods. Fortunately, there are many artists who take the subject seriously and are creating new and exciting designs. Philomena combines traditional patterns with modern fabrics to create this wonderful quilt. The Celtic Rose Window Quilt. It's a whole cloth stencil kit using five stencils. The inspiration for this project came from the need for a whole cloth Celtic quilt pattern. Stained glass windows in churches throughout Europe became the focus of Philomena's attention as she worked on the design. The origins of the first stained glass windows are lost in history. The technique of stained glass windows as we know them probably came from jewelry making, cloisonne, and mosaics. By the 10th century, stained glass window designs started to depict Christ, biblical scenes and decorative designs. They were found in French, German and English churches. Here's a quote from Philomena. May you enter heaven and be presented with all the quilts you were going to do on earth. Philomena has inspired many a person to quilt. Let's take a look at Celtic design made by Joan Sayer of Chester, California using the designs from one of Philomena's books. The Celts dominated mid and western Europe for a thousand years. But it is only recently that the importance of Celtic influence on the cultural, linguistic and artistic development of Europe has emerged. The Celts as an identifiable race or ethnic group have long since disappeared, except in places such as Ireland and the Scottish Highlands. The Celts transmitted their culture orally this accounts for the extreme lack of knowledge about them prior to their contact with the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome. What we do know is they were generally well educated, particularly on topics such as religion, philosophy, geography and astronomy, while earning a reputation as fearsome warriors. Celtic quilt created by Angela Madden of England, who's been quilting for 20 years and is the author of nine books. She teaches her style of contemporary quilt making worldwide. Her first quilt is the Celtic Star. This is a medallion style quilt with all the bias strips made of tissue lame. Circular patterns created from repeating, wedge-shaped sections produce fascinating Celtic knotwork designs.
from Iron Age artifacts. To present day greeting cards, their popularity has endured. Similar patterns appear in many other cultures worldwide. Many famous artists have played with this design concept and produced intricate patterns. Two of the best known were originally constructed for craft workers by Leonardo da Vinci and Albrecht Dürer. Their designs have been admired, but it has proved to be beyond the capabilities of the average person to produce similar patterns without resorting to photocopiers or exact reproductions. Anyone can learn how to reproduce original ones with a little practice. The application for craft workers in general, or for applique, embroidery, and quilting in particular, are endless. Another quilt by Angela Madden is Spring. A rainbow striped fabric was used for the bias strips and for the quilt border. The applique designs on this quilt are of a rabbit, a butterfly, and a duck. Celtic myths and legends provide clues to the importance of the representational images, more so in the later manuscripts. Many of these were animals. Dogs were symbolic of the instinctual nature of man, seen as protectors, friends, companions of heroes, and gods in Celtic mythology. Swans represented solar deities, had healing powers, and showed compassion sincerity and love. They were a favorite form of shape changer. Birds are portrayed many times in old manuscripts. They were messengers of the gods and bearers of good tidings. They too symbolized transformation and the ability to change shape. Celtic heroes often transformed themselves into birds and were then able to fly to foreign lands to avoid danger. The goose was a bird of heaven and associated with the gods of war, becoming a symbol of power. While birds represented air and animals represented earth, fish were also included to represent water. The salmon of knowledge was said to live in a vast river whose waters were infused with wisdom. It was caught by the legendary hero Fionn McCool who burnt his finger, touching it whilst cooking. He sucked the finger and immediately became wise. The next quilt is Magic Celtic. Circles form the basis for this method of quilting. They held great magical significance for the Celts. This quilt has tissue lame insets. Several different colors of fabric were used for the bias strips. The pieced border has a thread play style design machine stitched on it. What appears to be ribbon is really thread play. This is done freehand on the sewing machine. A very time consuming technique 
that requires some skill to do correctly. Celtic designs lend themselves beautifully to this machine sewn technique. They are speedy and good looking if well done. Machine embroidery, quilting and applique can produce high quality results in a fraction of the time needed to hand sew them. Our next quilt, My Cornish Heritage, comes from Vivianne Bradley of North Carolina. After a visit to Cornwall, England, Vivianne came back to the US and put together this wonderful quilt as a memento of her trip. Cornwall is in the picturesque part of the southwest tip of England. Populated since the Stone Age and never really ruled by London until comparatively recent times, Cornish history is different from the rest of Britain. There is a revival to bring back this Cornish language that was once spoken. It's a Celtic language thousands of years old. Cornwall has always been rich in folklore. Giants. Mermaids. Saints. Fairies. Knockers, Spriggans, and Pixies all live in Cornwall. The Pixies were all identical old men, no bigger than an inch tall. They wore red caps, white waistcoats, green stockings, and brown coats and trousers. On their feet, they wore brightly polished buckled shoes. The Pixies were good people who helped the old, but they were mischievous and played pranks on people. Certainly the Cornish believed that King Arthur was a Cornishman. All the places in the tales of King Arthur are to be found here, from where he was born to where he fought his last battle. From where he claimed Excalibur, from an anvil to the lake where it was returned. We'll be right back with more Celtic quilts, including a quilt created by Scarlet Rose, who's been quilting for 28 years and blends her Japanese heritage with those from her Scottish ancestors. But first, we're taking a short break, so KIXE, your local public television station, can ask for your support. That support helps keep programs like Celtic quilting on the air. Quilts do have an amazing capacity to tell stories. Now let's move on to our next quilter, Scarlet Rose. She's been quilting for 28 years. Her focus on Celtic design has been to incorporate elements from her Japanese heritage with those from her Scottish ancestors. This blending of cultures has created a unique style all her own. Her first quilt, Indian Summer, breaks the rules of making bias tape. Scarlet uses large print fabrics to make her tape, coming up with a new look. Picking and choosing what rules to break and what ones to follow is what Scarlet is all about. One rule that she does follow is a good Celtic artist will never leave a loose end on a strand unless it is stylized into a zoomorphic element, a flower or spiral 
since pure knots should always be unending. It is no wonder that much of the strongest surviving proof of Celtic art, in spite of its origins throughout the European continent, is found in the westernmost parts of Europe, Scotland and Ireland. In these areas, the Celtic people remained largely undisturbed by the Roman Empire. On to another quilt by Scarlet Rose, a Celtic rose garden. This medallion-style quilt uses a rainbow-striped lame. The iridescent shimmer of lame is a trademark of Scarlet's Celtic quilts. A stylized rose and bud conceals the end of the bias strips. This quilt also has hand quilting done with metallic thread, another of Scarlet's special touches. One form of artistic expression is abstract or geometric art. It imitates nothing. It constructs ornamental designs by means of a pleasing combination of flowing lines and decorative patterns. It is full of fancy and imagination and depends on a keen sense of rhythm balance and proportion. The objects produced by Celtic craftsmen were of elegant form and proportions. Decorations were always appropriate, applied with restraint, and not overloaded. New directions, new beginnings. This unique quilt has blocks based on 12-inch block format. This makes them interchangeable to some degree, something not commonly found in applique patterns. So knots and flowers can come together to form flower baskets, but on their own can form either Celtic knots or lozenges, which are rectangular shapes. After studying many art books, Scarlet realized there were designs that were similar to Celtic interlace, but which had originated in different cultures. It seemed that the idea of interlaced scrollwork had been done in variations all over the world, not just in Ireland. The kind done in Asia, Japan in particular, caught her eye. Her mother was Japanese, so she had always been interested in Japanese art. Scarlet started playing around with variations of interlace created by different cultures. Soon her own style evolved as she added flowers to the scroll work to give them a different look, something more representative of who she is. Celtic Medallion 2 of the four Celtic Medallion designs, this is Scarlet's favorite. It has her first attempt at quilting feather plumes in a freehand manner instead of using stencils. She used two lame fabrics in this wall hanging. The silver everyone spots right away but the black lame used in the bias strips blends in so well that it usually isn't noticed. Scarlet enjoys adding or using a fabric that otherwise would not be considered being used in a quilt. This brings out pleasant surprises to the finished quilt. Marva Packy of Southern California brings Celtic Medallion 4. 
This quilt was made from Scarlet Rose's first book, Celtic Style Floral Applique. To their maker, Celtic knots were not just surface decoration, but were symbolic. The interweaving of the cords is thought to signify many things. The in and out of the breathing, ceaseless movement, the continuity of life and eternity. From Susanville, California, comes this fun quilt by Mona Walters. Cocopelli meets the Celts. Mona is of Celtic heritage, Scots, Irish, and Welsh, and grew up in the Southwest, Colorado, and New Mexico areas. She wanted to do something that incorporated motifs from both backgrounds, and came up with this idea when she found some Cocopelli fabric that she liked. The hand quilting goes around the cords of the knots and the cocopelli figures in the center of each knot. The sashing is a garden path pattern with simple knots quilted in the pathways. At each border corner are hand quilted cocopelli figures. Petroglyphs of cocopelli are found carved on walls throughout the southwest of the United States, dating back 3,000 years. The Anasazi and Hopi Indians looked to Cocopelli to bring rain and fertility. His name means Coco for wood and Pilau for hump. Cocopelli brings happiness, fertility, and long life. The hump on his back is said to be full of seeds, which are scattered over the earth to bring new crops. The flute being a phallic symbol, some have called him the Casanova of the cliff dwellers. He is also thought to be a prankster. Hmm, I wonder if Cocopelli met the Celts a few thousand years ago somewhere. Overhand knots with Celtic ribbons border comes from Peg Bingham of Ohio. Peg has written a whole series of booklets, each featuring a pieced Celtic design. A new twist on Celtic quilting comes from Peg. She has decided that she would rather machine piece her Celtic quilts instead of appliquing them with bias strips. The same rules apply to her knot work. Knots should always be unending, even though the quilt has been completely machine sewn. Unlike all the other quilts in this show which are applique, this quilt has no applique at all. As we take a look today, one can clearly see copies of Celtic masterpieces with adaptations of old designs put into pottery, leatherwork, and of course quilts, which are becoming increasingly popular and easier to do. The next quilt is from Michiko Shima of Japan. Michiko started making Celtic style quilts in the 90s and has written a book on Celtic quilts. Michiko's love of old kimonos combined with Celtic quilting has produced some very interesting quilts. Let's take a look at her first one, a family crest. In Japan, they wear kimonos which have a family crest on them to dress up for special occasions. There are over 4,000 kinds of designs for family crests. Michiko chose her favorite designs from among them and made this quilt from kimono fabric. Michiko used black bias tape to make it look like leading in stained glass style designs and to help tie the quilt all together. The word kimono is a modern term. It started in the Meiji era, 1868 to 1912. 
This was a time of great openness in Japan after nearly three centuries of self-imposed seclusion. When pressed by foreigners to name their native style of dress, they used the word kimono, which means simply thing to wear. The Song of the Celebration. Michiko made this quilt as a celebration for her two children when they became 20 years old. 20 in Japan is coming of age and it means they are adults. Michiko puts this wish into the making of the quilt. They will meet lots of people and grow up more and more. The purple kimono fabric in this quilt is antique. Someone wore it for their coming of age celebration in 1920. The small rounded design on the left side is a family crest. The preservation of old fabrics has a special importance to the Japanese, and prolonging the life of old textiles is a spiritual exercise. The prolonging of life also has a symbolic meaning. A patchwork robe given to a loved one or a respected superior implies the hope for a long life. The number of patches in such a garment may appropriately match the age of the person especially the birthdays of 77, 88, and 99. The next quilt is the flower in water. Michiko wanted to preserve the rose design in her quilt because the rose design is really rare in kimono. When she set the blue cotton with the rose design, it reminded her of her childhood. It looked exactly like a flower in a vase, which was full of water, which she saw during her childhood. Tradition dictated certain patterns and color to be worn according to the season and one's age. For example, a young woman would wear red and pink with floral designs in spring, while in summer, her kimono would suggest water. In autumn, she would wear floral designs or chrysanthemums, and in winter, especially at holiday time, designs based on pine trees plum blossoms and bamboo. All are Japanese good luck symbols. Michiko's last quilt, Oriental Leaf, uses variegated colored fabrics to emulate the colored leaves, which are put together to form this wonderful quilt with a connected, endless Celtic design. Michiko used bias tape to give the whole quilt a stained glass look. Celtic designs are found in many other art forms.
We can't bring them all to you, but we found these wonderful Irish dance dresses and couldn't resist showing them to you. The artist is Kate Nolan of New York. This girl's blue velvet dress is traditional with a crocheted collar and a kite-shaped cape. There is applique with all satin fabrics and machine embroidered knotwork as well. It's done in a traditional bird design. The skirts are now stiffened in order to make them stand out from the body at the sides. There is machine embroidery on the sleeves. Skirts, necklines, cuffs and panel edges are also sculpted. The neckline is traditional in that it can be no lower than the dancer's center front collarbone. Skirts must also be no more than four inches above the knee. Sleeves must be full length, no short sleeves or sleeveless. The blue velvet is the old style dress. The costumes worn by Irish dancers today commemorate the clothing of the past. Each school of dancing has its own distinct dancing costume. Dresses are based on the Irish peasant dress, worn 200 years ago. Most of the dresses are adorned with hand-embroidered Celtic designs. Copies of the Tara brooch are often worn on the shoulder. The brooch holds a cape which falls over the back. Let's take a look at a more modern style dress. This is what's popular now. This girl's dress is made with pink holographic lycra fabric. The appliques are of chartreuse satin, cerise and turquoise glitter ball, white and black spotlight velour, silver lame, and black sewn sequins. The pleats are decorated with black sewn sequins. The lining is chartreuse green, the satin neck, hem, sleeves, and skirt panels all have sculpted edges. And the worldwide success of River Dance, and more recently the Lord of the Dance, has placed Irish dance on the international stage. Dancing schools in Ireland today are filled with young pupils keen to imitate and learn the dancing styles which brought Jean Butler and Michael Flatley international acclaim. Kate mentioned that the two dresses show the main differences in the style of Irish dancing competition dresses. Those are beautiful dresses, Anne. All the things we've seen are so impressive, Patrick. This has been a fascinating look at Celtic art. You know, Anne, in recent years, interest in the Celtic peoples and their lives has increased dramatically. To the benefit of all who are interested in the world of the ancient Celts, a number of authors, scholars, and others have taken up the subject. They've written about or researched many tales from the lives of our ancestors. Some have lifted the veil and lay open for us the hidden story inside the story as a means of finding ourselves. Among the ever-increasing store of Celtic heritage, we may find some hidden gems be between the diamonds. This show is brought to you in part with a grant from Hokuma's Sewing Center in Redding, California, and viewers like you.